This is Italy, a small country the size of Florida, with so many languages that someone from here can't even understand someone from here. And that's just today, when things are relatively chilled. It was not always this way. There are so many dialects in Italy that the country used to be completely dysfunctional, so everyone got together, had a big fight about which dialect they should choose as the official Italian language. And the Italian that we know today almost didn't make it. Penso che l'italiano essendo molto musicale se sei nel flow ce la fai. Let's start with the basics. Italian is the official language of Italy, but there are so many variations of the language that people from the north of Italy often claim that they don't understand a thing that the southerners say. What's more, many of these are not just dialects, but different languages altogether, which means that if you head out to rural Italy armed with your fresh intermediate Italian skills, well, there is no guarantee that you will understand anything the locals are saying. Maybe you've experienced this yourself. Now, remember this guy? His language is Romagnol, and some say that it's the most unintelligible language of Italy. Very handy though, if you happen to be going to San Marino. See, although everyone understands standard Italian, many Italians speak a different first language or a distinct dialect that comes from their hometowns. Uh, in Veneto, Malsese è un po' bellissimo perché ha le montagne e il lag. If you want to understand this, we've got to go right back to the beginning. In the beginning, there was Latin. You knew that. Latin gave us French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Catalan, and Romanian. And there are various dialects of each of these languages. But this is not a case of Latin being the grandparent, Italian being the parent, and the dialects being the offspring. It's more like Latin had a lot more kids than you thought, and a bunch of these siblings all went to live in Italy. There were numerous states and kingdoms back then, each with their own languages and traditions. Often in historical situations like this, borders would have been drawn and you kind of get like, this is my country, this is your country, let's keep things nice and separate. And then when Italy was unified in 1861, the different languages remained. So today, Italy and its islands still have about 34 languages that are completely separate languages, like Sicilian, Sardinian, and Neapolitan. And this is all in one country the size of Florida. So what exactly then is the Italian language that we learn as foreigners? Well, that's simple. All of the ancient peoples of Italy, including pre-Romans, were an ethno-linguistic group that we call the Italics. The dominant tribe was the Latins, and it's thought that they migrated to Italy in the late Bronze Age. Jumping centuries ahead, people in Italy were speaking around 1,000 dialects, but Latin was still being used by scholars and writers. Remember, most people were illiterate, which is why we get the separation of the scholarly Latin and then the spoken dialects. The first written evidence considered to be an Italian language that was not Latin is some legal documents known as the Platici Cassinesi, basically a property dispute. It's riveting stuff. But some say that this text that a monk scribbled on a piece of parchment, the Veronese riddle, is actually the oldest. Who knows? My money goes on the riddle. Anyway, by the 16th century, Italy really needed a single national language. And so with so many options, how do you choose? See, it is an interesting thought experiment. Imagine today's fractured politics, where everything is polarized to the point of violence. Can you imagine everyone coming together and agreeing on a new language for the entire country? It's unthinkable. But this is exactly what the Italians did. There were three main points of view. Some people wanted the language spoken in the king's court. And these were important Renaissance men like Castiglione, who were who was big buddies with the artist Raphael. Then the purists, like this guy, Bembo, argued that they simply had to use the vernacular of the great writers and poets, just as long as it wasn't Dante, and I'll tell you why in a second. Then you've got diplomats like Machiavelli, who wrote an, inst like an instruction book for princes. I kid you not, he insisted that they should choose the most elegant words out of the various dialects spoken by ordinary people. These guys are literally designing the language here. But just imagine for a second being part of that spectacularly significant squabble. How on earth did they choose? Well, listen to this. Remember Dante? Well, he was one of the great writers and poets from the 13th century. And in his time, the Tuscan language had a pretty dialect called Florentine or dialetto fiorentino. Dante and his writer buddies spoke Florentine, so it enjoyed a lot of prestige. Poets were extremely popular back then and they were giving this dialect tons of exposure. Now, although people were speaking different dialects, 
All the writing was done in Latin, it's just how it worked. But Dante was a bit of a maverick and he decided to write a huge narrative poem about his fantastic travel through hell, purgatory and paradise and called it, you guessed it, the Divine Comedy. But instead of writing this epic masterpiece in Latin, which would have been the normal way to do it, he wrote it in a language that he called Italian, which was Florentine with a twist of Latin and a sprinkle of other dialects that he knew. You've got to love a 13th century rebel genius, haven't you? And did I mention he was later condemned to perpetual exile? But that's another story. Anyway, back to the 16th century Italians arguing over the language. So the purists were voting for the language of poets, just not Dante's invented language. They thought that the Divine Comedy just wasn't dignified enough. He'd mixed elegant expressions with vulgar ones. Dante, you rebel, you. But here's the thing. The Divine Comedy was a massive success, genius level. People were talking about it for centuries. They still are. So in the end, it came down to Tuscan or Venetian, the other popular choice. Weirdly, the guy who finally decided that Tuscan wins, he was the Puritan Bembo, and he was actually Venetian. So kind of confusing. But there you have it, the Florentine Tuscan dialect became the standard Italian language. Mind you, since most people were illiterate, they just kept on speaking in their own dialects anyway, while the educated 3% adopted standard Italian. But nothing was ever simple with old Italy. In the 18th and 19th centuries, arguments and debates resumed. Which was the correct form of Italian to use? And people had really strong feelings about this. There was even a phrase used for this dispute, la questione della lingua, the question of the language. After Italy was unified in 1861, the Tuscan dialect, which remember was Dante's dialect, was finally made the official language. But still, the heat continued right into the 20th century. It's kind of getting exhausting. But any guesses when Italian as we know it now finally became the official language of Italy? Put your guesses in the comments and I will reveal the answer at the end. But no cheating and skipping ahead. Whatever your guess is for the year that Italian became the official language of Italy, punch it in now. So if that's that and it's finally settled, how do real Italians in Italy actually speak now? Well, let's find out. But if you've learned anything interesting so far in this video, you might like to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you hear about future videos too. These days, Italians generally understand which part of the country someone comes from by their accent alone. Now, standard Italian is normal and it's taught in schools, and we can partly thank television for that, as it did a lot to unify the language in the 1950s. Caetano, mi ricordava, siccome in questa casa mi occupa anche un po' di amministrazione, anzi appunto, quest'anno abbiamo deciso di imbiancare un po' le cellule. Right. Many regional terms have even made it into the national language now, coming from Tuscany, Lombardy, Veneto, Naples, Sicily, which gives the Italian language a real flavor of the whole country. Now, interestingly, they say that only 1% of the Italian population has mastery of pure standard pronunciation. So if you are learning Italian as a foreigner, well, you really have nothing to fear from having a little accent. Now, naturally, in most educational resources, like my books of short stories, the audio recording you will hear will be in standard standard Italian, so at least it makes it easier for you to practice your pronunciation. And when it comes to pronunciation, the best way to develop a good accent in Italian is to listen a lot. So you have to perceive the sounds first before you can produce them themselves. And if you want more tips and on learning Italian in general, then you can check out my story learning kit. It'll teach you how to learn Italian through stories, which is really cool. And it's completely free, so you can check the link in the description for that. Today, there are 68 million speakers of Italian, and the vast majority of them live in Italy, including Sicily and Sardinia. It's also an official language in San Marino, the Vatican City, Switzerland, and part of Istria as well. Italian is also spoken nearby in the south of France, and in Corsica as well, you'll hear one of the Tuscan dialects. But the crazy thing about Italian is how far the language has spread around the world. In my video about Italian-American immigrants, I told the phenomenal story of how Italians ended up in the US. But there were also big migrations to Australia and South America. Argentina, for example, is chock full of Italians, and Sao Paulo in Brazil has the highest concentration uh, of Italians outside of Italy. So think about that for a minute. You can literally learn Italian while living in Brazil. Could life get any better? But it's not just South America. You will also find Italian in Malta, Libya, Slovenia, Croatia, and Somalia. So what about this language then? Well, modern Italian is a beautiful language with clear vowels and rolled R's. And an unmatched use of body language. What? Come on. 
full of people. What do I care? Of all the Romance languages, Italian stayed closest to Latin, but the modern vocabulary and syntax is a lot more like French. It's just way easier to read and to pronounce. It's also highly phonetic. Listen to this. Imparare l'italiano ti renderà felice. See how the sounds match the letters? Almost all Italian words end in vowels, which gives the language a lot of its kind of singing quality. There are two noun genders in Italian, and things like articles and prepositions are quite promiscuous actually and get up to all kinds of funny business when you use them together. Italian also uses the subjunctive a lot more than Portuguese or French do, but for the most part, Italian is a subject verb object language, just like English. And the trickiest part really is probably the verb conjugations, along with the occasional tongue twister. So there are some really interesting words in Italian that are quite tricky to pronounce. You want to try? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Chiacchiericcio. Chiacchiericcio. Not bad. Cinquecento cinquantacinque. Okay, now you're joking. Have that have one more time. Cinquecento cinquantacinque. Cinquecento cinquantacinque. Good. How about this? Aiuola. A lot of vowels in that one. Ay, ayuola, ayuola. Ayuola. Perfect. I can Good. feel my mouth muscles moving throughout. And now a true tongue twister. Tre tigri contro tre tigri. Yeah, I've heard this one before. Tre tigri contro tre tigri. Tre tigri contro tre tigri. You did a better job than I did. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry though, most Italian words really are quite straightforward to pronounce. And in fact, there are some Italian words in dialect that sound totally weird, but then as soon as you see them in standard Italian, they make a lot more sense. So let's see if you know what this word means. Ready? Let's go. Bischero. Bischero. No idea. Sounds like nothing I've heard before. This was from uh, Tuscany, a dialect from Tuscany. Uh, okay. Let's try in another dialect now. Pirla. 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 No, nothing. Still nothing. <laughs> this was Milanese. Uh, the same word in standard Italian is stupido. Stupido. Stupid. So all of those words actually mean stupid? Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting. So the dialect words are kind of totally unique, but in standard Italian, we understand it. Is that because it's from a, like the same Latin roots so, so that we would understand it from English as well? Exactly, exactly. In Latin, it was stupidus, but it's funny because we also have another word in Italian, which is stolto, that's a high register Italian, that comes from another Latin word that was stultus. Fascinating. So why should anybody learn Italian? Well, believe it or not, Italian is the fourth most studied language in the world. And if you are the creative type, listen up. Musicians, well, most musical terms are in Italian and you know how many Italian operas there are. Actors, imagine taking an Italian cinema course in Italy. Dante lovers, it's the same. Italy has wonderful literature courses. Foodies, Italy, well, you know this, it's a world leader in the culinary arts. And it's the same with art, fashion, design, architecture. Italian is a reference language for all of these and a lot more. It's even a major language of science and engineering. So if you fancy working for Ferrari, join the queue, but in Italian, of course. Now, I asked you earlier to guess when Italian became the official, the really official language of Italy. Ready? 2007. If you thought that was interesting, you liked this video, well, you'll love the story of why there are so many Italians in America 